resonate from the really small to the extra great and you are such a melody that the heavens lean down just to sing it to me it's all music 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 feel this all vibrate from the roots of a tree to the tip of the tongue of a snake yes we all create together in love what a song we can make it's all music 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 Your notes are all interlaced I feel you contained Nothing out of place It's all music Rest now, little one, you're already here, there's no more to be done. In the morning, we'll greet the sun and celebrate what a song we've sung, it's all music. Wow. <laughs> thank oh, thank you. Thank you, Nemi and God. Um, um, for episode seven of Sam Liu and Cased, I'm here talking um, with Nate Maingold, who's a poet, songwriter, singer and guitarist from South Africa. What else would you say you are? <laughs> What else would I say? Um, uh, I, what I think, oh man, this is a question I've actually been thinking about a lot recently, so I'm, I'll do my best to give a brief answer. But I think the idea of identifying with the things I do or we, that we do, I think society teaches us to do that a lot. It's such an interesting uh, capacity, like it's such an interesting habit. Um, so at this point, what I'm more and more realizing is that I am an awareness having an experience and following whatever seems important and worthy of passion to me. So in some ways, I am an awareness that enjoys carving spoons. I'm an awareness that enjoys, as you said, poetry and writing and reading and making love and dancing and singing and experiencing life as honestly as possible. Uh, and as I've said for the last several years or many years, in fact, I am a modern troubadour. I think that's the closest I've come to finding out like, what is it that my role in the world is? Mm. Yeah, there's a, a question um, from Carl Jung, actually, which is, you know, what is it that wants to come into the world through you? Uh, uh, absolutely. I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite a worthy question, but I think there's a lot in there. Um, there's something something about that. That quote came to me there. I've interviewed several people who um, might also describe themselves or be described as troubadours. So mm -hmm. travellers, hemisphere hoppers, buskers, street musicians. And um, there's something about this this kind of life that I'm very drawn to. And um, it also reflects mm -hmm. the kind of life that, that I've lived as well, which is one of mobility and thinking about musicians and mobility and how in 2020, we are subject to um, these conditions. Um, obviously, we're, we're recording this in lockdown. So firstly, you know, how is, how is um, lockdown affecting you in terms of 
live streaming? Um, what have you been doing to reach out to that audience? It's interesting. When lockdown started, I had quite a few people write to me yeah. and express how they were like, you just were so ahead of the curve because I've been using the internet for years as a tool to connect with people all over the world. I'm, a, I'm funded through Patreon and I have been live streaming since probably 2014 on and off here and there. Also uploading videos and all the kind of lots of online stuff. And so for me, it was kind of a familiar realm to be roaming in. And concurrently with me being online a lot over the last several years or many years, I was going through a pretty severe kind of breaking down of the self, which, you know, I, I called it depression for a while. I called it burnout. Uh, really just symptoms of a life out of alignment or a, a perception out of alignment. And so... I've, so many, I've like, I felt like I was coming out of my personal lockdown as the external lockdown began. And I haven't really felt the lockdown in the same way that many have. And so it's kind of, I haven't thought of it in that way before. But as I'm saying it now, I realize that, you know, while many people have been panicked about being locked down or locked in uh, into their own space and into their own kind of reflection of themselves up close and personal, I felt actually very liberated in many ways, although, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I would choose differently where I in charge of how this world has responded to this. But um, but for me, like my beloved and I are blessed enough to have access to a farm. And so we've been here since the beginning of our lockdown in South Africa and have actually used this time as an opportunity really to to focus in on what seems most authentic, which to me is personal practices and anything that brings me closer to that present state of I am here now. So I found it to be quite an amazing time. And I also have experienced a lot of sadness and frustration and even anger uh, when looking at so many of my companions on the road who have really been so negatively impacted by the lockdown, especially as you say, those of I mean, many of my friends are musicians and seeing how no one's touring and no one's able to get out there and play their music. And I think that that is quite a large issue. Mm. And whereabouts are you now? I'm in South Africa and we're on a farm just outside of Cape Town. So could you tell, uh, us, yeah, could like you tell us a little bit about the view from the window? <laughs> that's a good actually the view is quite see. nice here i can't see too far but uh if i stand on tippy toes i can see over the trees that are growing up around the cottage and i can look, see the mountains in the distance we're in a valley so we're surrounded everywhere i turn there's mountains i'm, I'm ringed by mountains and uh it's quite a cloudy day today but it's beautiful the air is fresh and i can see as far as the mountains wow i love the way that you said the trees are growing up <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, they, what I like about that um, I'm thinking about trees and I was looking um, through my um, DMs the other day and I realized that I had a DM from you going back to about 2015 but it was talking about planting a tree wow I know exactly what that was about that was amazing that's yeah. so cool what a, what a coincidence <laughs> I just I thought yeah. this isn't the first time that we've been in touch so what is the relationship between trees and music in your work? Uh, it's interesting. You know, there, there are symbols which appear again and again in my music, and one of them is trees. And it's, for as far as I know, I mean, please <laughs> never think me arrogant enough to pretend that I know exactly what spirit is, is thinking when it, it shares through me. <laughs> but um, what I've picked up... <laughs> is that it's about the cycles. Uh, so that everything in nature, everything in in the universe or infinity or God or whatever name anyone feels comfortable to give it, uh, works in cycles. So cycles of knowing and cycles of not knowing and cycles of season and cycles of growth and cycles of decay. And it all kind of goes circular. And, uh, and humans, as far as I can tell so far, are the only creatures that have built linear systems. So we... You know, look at a piece of plastic as a great example. Even that will eventually circle back into the 
great circling that is happening. We've just t tried to extend it as long as possible and cause ourselves a lot of discomfort along the way. And so for me, trees are just that beautiful representation of seasonal elements and how um, the there's actually one of my recent songs called Every Leaf. And uh, it's I had a, quite a profound experience looking at a leaf sitting under a tree. Uh, I would call it a mystical experience even of just becoming aware of my my tiny sp spot within the great infinite unfolding. And uh, it was quite a relief to realize oh, it's not all it's not all me. It's not all on me. I'm just here having the experience. And at the end, um, the final line actually says, and it's the only time in the song I say it, but it says, look at all these seeds, because the whole song is about great mystery, about who knows what it's all for. What does this all mean? Like, what is this great mystery we're in? And so very much questioning, questioning, questioning. And, and at the end, it doesn't give an answer, but it's like, well, I don't have the answer, but look at all these seeds. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that that's what I love about trees is the reminder of that incredible miracle that like if if any, I think um, Krishnamurti might have said it, I can't remember who, but but someone said, if you take a moment and pause and look at anything, anything at a, at a leaf or a bug or an ant or either tiniest of things that seem inconsequential and really pause long enough to look at them, you'll realize that as much care and love and attention and detail went into that tiny thing as went into you. And it's a really good way to gain perspective on reality. And so, yeah, I just love trees for how good they are at at sort of envisioning or making visible the cyclical nature of everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Nate, I found you online. I was doing a basic um, Google search for nomadic singer-songwriters and most most of um, most of the uh, people that show up are kind of guys that live in the States and they travel around a lot. Um, so how would you define being a nomadic songwriter? I don't know if I could define myself as that anymore, although I am in my spirit that. And I, I've just, I really believe that, that all humans were evolved to be nomadic. I know that from an archaeological, anthropological perspective, that before we started playing with civilization, we would have all been part of nomadic tribes. And so to me, the state of of be, being in one place forever is feels completely unnatural. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, I also acknowledge that, that right now in the state we're in, we don't have enough space for everyone to just be moving around all the time. We don't have the resources for that. So I'm having this interesting process in myself where I feel nomadic in my spirit. I feel like to be moving and to be experiencing new vistas on a regular basis is something I greatly desire and greatly enjoy. At the same time, I'm focusing more currently on rooting into a place. And so mm. Carly and I are on the farm we're on and we're, you know, starting to put down some raised beds and grow a herb garden and all those kind of things, you know, fix up stuff around the place and, and put energy into a space. And so it's, I'm finding it very interesting. So for me, I, I guess I don't really know. It's a tough question to answer because I still feel like I am a nomadic troubadour. And at the same time, I feel very rooted where I am, or at least I feel like that's what the invitation from the universe is for me right now, is to focus on roots rather than on mobility. Yeah. And it's it's inviting you into a space to create, isn't it? Um, I think a lot about this dichotomy between mobility and being rooted. Um, mm -hmm. The late... John Berger in um, his book on post-truth confabulations, which was written in 2016, he talks about song as metaphor, the ontology of song. And, and one of his quotes is that songs lean forward. And I think this is um, it's a really interesting way to think about songs, as in they are directional. They're sort of headed somewhere. Mm. What do you think? I, I I think that's a beautiful thing to think about. I I have to admit that I'm not super obsessed about answers, but I really enjoy good questions, and <laughs> uh, and that, I think that's a very fantastic fantastic question uh, so to to be sitting with. 
yeah, do songs lean forward? And and if so, what does that mean? And like, what does that bring up in me? And how does that relate to my songs? And so, I mean, if I, I yeah, it's interesting. I, I used to write songs that always needed a happy ending. <laughs> and, uh, and I wonder, and, and now I've become more comfortable with writing songs that end on questions. Uh, like even that song, like I mentioned, Every Leaf, now look at all these seeds kind of going, so what is it all like? What do we? I, I, it's the song. The whole song says, "I know nothing. What majesty is this? I am in awe." And the final line is like, "But look at all these seeds. There's something there." And so maybe that is leaning forward. And yeah, by the same token, I have another song called "Letting You Know," which I wrote when I was really in a difficult space, and and it was a kind of acknowledgement that I was not alone in that space, even though many times I like to convince myself, oh, what is, no one's ever had it like I've had it. It's super hard. And no one knows what it feels like to be going through what I'm going through. And this whole song is kind of the acknowledgement. I'm just letting you know. I'm just letting you know. And each each time that line comes around, it feeds into the next verse. And except for the final one, where it finishes on, I'm just letting you know, I love you. And so maybe that's leaning forward to a place and a time where we are all letting one another know <laughs> how connected we really are. And we can start pretending that everything is separate and that, uh, that what happens here doesn't affect what happens there and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Berger also talks about how songs are uh, headed towards a listening ear. I, th- I thought that was really nice. Yeah. Mm. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the value of a song. Um, I'm just going to quote you here. (laughs) You said, "Um, the value of a song is intrinsically um, zero. No one wants to go out and buy a song without some kind of incentive. So my objective is to build a relationship with the people who care about my music, who have really gotten some value out of it. How do you feel about that now? Yeah, I it's a, it's an interesting one because I I feel like the 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 intrinsic value of a shong, song shouldn't be zero, uh, but I but based on my observation in the world today, it is getting as close to zero as as it's possible. For example, look at a streaming platform like Spotify, who pays zero point zero zero two US cents per stream. So I don't know how most musicians in the world will get enough streams to make any kind of a respectable income from something like that. And so just on a very practical level, it's it seems that that just based on and, and by my own experience of selling songs on Bandcamp or wherever, what it's what has become clear to me is that the people who will spend money on that are generally the people who have some other kind of relationship with my music where they They've had an experience through it or they've had an experience through me from a live stream or from following me on social media, something that has impacted them in some different way that it's not like, oh, that's just another song by another person. Like, you know, just carry on listening and move on. But there's actually, you know, like I can think of there's one who who jumps out. It was one of my patrons and his life was potentially saved by my music. Uh, He had lost the love of his life to cancer. Um, They'd been, I think, together for 20 years and and it, it utterly just shattered him he moved back in with his parents he lost his job he just everything fell apart for him and was in the process of falling apart and until he heard one of my songs and that song just kind of gave him whatever it was that he had needed and so for him that song was a was a life-saving song and so he will probably always be a patron, or at least for as long as he can afford to be, and will always be someone who values what I bring into the world. And so, yeah, I, I think because music has become so, it's just everywhere. It's in an elevator in the background. It's in every movie. It's, it's just, it's everywhere. And so people have kind of forgotten. And also, by the same token, I mean, a lot of the music that's out right now, every time I turn on the radio, I'm just thinking, how, how is this possible? How is this what is being when when we have such serious and real and beautiful and sad and meaningful challenges and triumphs being experienced around the world every day in in uncountable countless ways, and what's on the radio is hey shake that ass I love you when you pass me on the street yeah like it's just it's just utter the shallowest level of human connection that could possibly be is how 
generally objectifying someone um, and talking about love as a love as something that claims something else. Love is something that's about ownership or like you need to be mine or I won't survive, like that kind of stuff. And I just so I can understand why maybe many people who have access to that kind of music don't value it very well because it's not really giving them that like core because music originally would have been the community experience gathered around a fire chanting singing dancing rhythmically pulsing to a, to the to these incredible vibrations that would have like uplifted and connected people in ways I think most humans today don't even can't even imagine. Uh, so anyway, that's I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of went off on yeah, one there, but <laughs> roundabout. So coming back to love, an LMG magazine say Main God writes protest songs for lovers and love songs for rebels. So tell us a little bit about that. I think that's my one of my absolute favorite quotes ever. From <laughs> that was when I had just just started playing. It was that must have been like late 2011 or early 2012, mm. and I was just playing professionally. So anyway, and um, love songs for rebels, protest songs for lovers, protest songs for lovers. yeah. I, you know, I don't know. My songs have a, they're like impossibly gentle and also brutal at times. Uh, there, there's no pretending that there is a a truth on either side of the line. There, it's like they incorporate the elements of the gentle, poetic, romantic lover and of the insane, depressed, burnt out madman. Uh, and I, I don't mean they do. I don't know. That's how it feels to me anyway, because often the songs are coming from. And so I guess they're for people who are exploring the edge of things um, in the same way. I mean, one of my absolute inspirations is Amanda Palmer. And mm-hmm. I, I, I don't actually, I, I don't really enjoy listening to her music generally. I find it just doesn't really click with me in terms of the sound of it. Um, it does lyrically, but I struggle with the sound of it. And that that doesn't take away in the slightest from how much respect I have for her and how much love. And I just, I, I've been to one live show of hers, which through a crazy series of events, um, I ended up playing two songs to open for her when she played in South Africa a few years ago. And she had a sold out crowd of say, you know 700 people. And when I played to that crowd, I was like, oh, this is my people. These are, This is totally my people. Like it was just because and, and watching her play was one of the most transformative experiences because she just it was like watching myself. But maybe in like 20 years, you know, like just the master of being purely real and raw in the moment as it happens. And so I guess that those those love songs for rebels like people who are rebelling who are like transforming themselves and protest songs for lovers those who love madly and 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 are outside of what is considered maybe normal or safe or or respectable um i think those kind of people feel connected to this kind of music because it is without artifice mm-hmm. um anyway that's what i think well, i imagine that she's a vulnerable yet defiant kind of stage presence i i haven't seen her live but i am aware of her book um, the art of asking and mm-hmm. has that influenced your crowdfunding kind of and movement into patreon and you said that of patreons we talked about salvation a little bit as in um the listener who heard one of your songs and that um gave him hope at a certain time you've said of patrons that they've saved your life your patrons are heroic mm. yeah it's true i mean again in a world where m- most people i mean i don't know how many people have listened to my music around the world but it's certainly in the sort of tens of thousands. And out of those tens of thousands, there are a few hundred of them who have, who have, for whatever reason, found the value and chosen to share their abundance with me through becoming patrons. And I could not be a professional musician without that support. And so to me, that is heroic. To be a person who is, who is bucking the trend, you know, where for most, for most people consuming or absorbing music, it's, it's done without a real connection to the people who are creating it. And my patrons are the opposite of that. They are utterly understanding and and cognizant of what their support does for me and also what my music does for them. For them, it feels like a perfectly valuable and valid exchange. Um, So yeah, there's that. And then in terms of Patreon and crowdfunding, I, I, I think I was on Patreon before I ever definitely a few years before Amanda Palmer joined Patreon. Mm-hmm. And when I, 
I saw her, I haven't, I've started her book, but I have so many piles of books I'm currently trying to read. And I, it's one of the ones that dropped by the wayside, but uh, I'm very excited to read it. Her talk, The Art of Asking, her TED talk, when I watched that, it was like for the first time I heard from someone who had like a mainstream, or not mainstream, but had a, 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 a big voice where lots of people were listening, where she just re reflected exactly the way I've always felt. And I've always wanted, I've always tried to give my music away not to give it away for free, but to say, if you need it, you must have it. And if you can, please support it. Like that, that seems like a fair exchange. Instead of me saying, if you can't pay this amount of money, you don't get the music. Like that just has never made sense to me, but it's also been very scary because I don't really, like I give it away very easily. And then I wonder if I valued it more, if I said, well, if you can't pay this and you can't have it, then maybe people would buy it more. But it just has never felt true to me and just watching Amanda Palmer and, and, and seeing that talk and just learning about what she was doing really it was the first time I just heard someone else be like this is okay <laughs> and it was amazing <laughs> mm. yeah she's kind of like affirming something to you exactly yeah how was the tip jar with um, give wordpress how's that worked for you Oh, it's been amazing. I, <laughs> I, I find it to be such a, a wonderful way to, to monetize. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's basically busking online. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And I, I love, I really, I, I love finding companies that are doing cool stuff and are doing it with real sincerity. Like I, there's nothing much like authenticity really talks to me and, and they are utterly committed to what they're doing. I'm actually co-hosting a, a little sort of, I guess, a webinar or, yeah, I think it's a webinar with with Give because um, there's a website that is helping to fund musicians who are sort of playing music online and help, and it's all run through through Give's platform or, or through Give's plugin. Yeah. And they're, they're, they've set up a whole site to help people get paid playing music online. And I just think, anyway, it's, it's fantastic. So I love what they're doing. I also, I, I've kind of gone a little more complex now, which I sometimes think hasn't actually served me as well as I, as it might have. Um, but I'm using other platforms for my tip jar and kind of exploring different things because then it means I can put like pop-ups over the video. And I, I, I'm this strange mix of like the ultimate barefoot wandering hippie and super geeky techie. Uh, it's, it's, it kind of tears me up sometimes. <laughs> you seem to me to be really on it. As I was, as I was researching things, I thought, oh, gosh, um, you really know what you're doing with all this jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to talk a little little bit about storytelling within your songs and mm. this idea of archetype and archetypal journeys through songs. You talk a little bit about this in some of the interviews, and I wondered if you might you might tell us something about how archetype works within songs for you. Uh, that's a great question, and thank you for thank you for asking it. It's okay. It's interesting because I'm I'm not someone who. I haven't studied deeply any of the kind of philosophy or psychology or any of those kind of things, but I have picked a lot of it up along the way just because it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned early on was that the more honest I could be about a song when writing a song, the more honest I could be about my personal experience, my personal perception, or the story I felt was important to tell, the more universal it somehow became in that you know, I could write a song, uh, for example, about my, like my, one of them is called In the Shadows. And it's all about the shadow. It's all about the shadow part of myself that I spent a long time running away from seeing if I could, you know, if I can, get, if I can run fast enough or far enough, I can leave all of this behind me. Because first of all, I was externalizing it. So I'd arrive in a new place. Yeah. And within a few months time, I would, the same relationship dynamics would happen. The same experiences would start popping up. And every time I would go, well, it must be the people or it must be the place. I'm going somewhere else. And I'd go somewhere else and the same thing would start to happen. And it <laughs> took me a while to click and go, oh, hang on. I am the common denominator. Yeah. It is in me. And so there's an archetypal experience there. I spoke about my experience 
of what it felt like for me personally to go through that. But that is an archetypal experience for everyone to to have shadow elements and to have part the demons, you know, the darkness, the stuff that we want to turn away from. But the, in reality, those parts are actually our teachers and also just parts of us that have been neglected or denied access to the light. And that's why they're in the shadows. And uh, and so it just feels that I just started to really make sense to me that I would play these shows and I play songs that felt so personal, like ultimately personal. And people would come up and go, oh, yeah, I totally related to that in terms of this thing and that thing. And I was like, wow, so this is actually this feels arc, arc, archetypical, archetypal in that in that I'm sharing something I'll, ultra personal and yet it is re relatable to others in their own story so i what it comes down to for me is that everyone experiences love everyone experiences loss everyone experiences trials everyone experiences triumphs and those archetypal experiences are only unique in the details and i love that i'm thank god for that otherwise life would be incredibly dull if it was just the same details for everyone and um, and that's kind of as far as I've taken it. I'm sure that there's much more in terms of we, like all the kind of language that could be used to describe archetypal stuff. And for me, it's just that it seems that there is this like subconscious dream world. I think Jung might talk about that. But as I say, I'm not too well read up on all that kind of stuff. But that there, there's this kind of like subconscious dream world that has these images, these symbols that are super strong and carry throughout all societies, throughout all generations. And that those are the, I feel like those are the kind of things I'm talking to in the best of my songs. <laughs> Mm. I thank you for that. Yeah, I wrote a paper recently and I was arguing for improvisation as a legitimate form of songwriting. Mm. Um, and this is to do with the way that I make songs. Um, I'm a bit tentative to use the word write because I don't really write songs with a, I don't sit down consciously with a pen and paper and write songs that way. Um, so, yeah. And what does it mean to be a songwriter there? But um, what what's the role of improvisation in your songwriting practice? <laughs> it's 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 uh, most of it, I think. <laughs> um, I I have people often ask me that. You know, how how did you think of that line? How did you think of that song? I'm like, well, I don't know. If you work it out, you tell me. Um, but I like I have so many of my songs. I. I don't plan them. Sometimes I'll have the experience of, like I have one called It's the Little Things, where I had been thinking about how it's the little, th you know, that saying that people say, someone brings a cup of coffee or opens the door or some sweet thing, and someone else goes, oh, you know, it really, it's the little things. And I th thought about that, it really, and I went deep into it. I was like, you know what, that's like one of the most profound sayings I've ever heard, and yet it's like a throwaway statement. Mm -hmm. Because Every big thing is made up of little things. There is no big thing that exists without little things. And even the little things themselves are made up of even smaller things. And anyway, so so that song, I'd been, it had been in my mind and I'd just been sitting it. And then I sat down the first time I ever sat down with my own ukulele and I'd learned like four chords and that whole song arrived. And, and at that same time, another one, and I hadn't been thinking at all about this at all. Like I sat down with my guitar and I started playing another, just a little rhythm. And a whole other song poured out that I really was, at first, I was like, I just do not understand what this is talking about. And it's become one of my favorite songs. It's called Everything Is Not What It Appears. And uh, and it's and it's the song of the jester, the song of, which is one of my favorite archetypes, if that is an archetype, I think it is, but the fool, because I love the fool because the fool is the one, who, no one like respects the fool because they're all dressed in motley and they're wild and loud and tumbling and just like saying all this crazy stuff. But what's amazing is because everyone expects them to be wild and crazy, they, they're the ones who get to speak the truth without fear of reprisal. And so if one listens to the fool, one generally has access to some pretty incredible information. And so to write a song for the fool, but to write it entirely freeze like I, I there was no I mean if you listen to the lyrics like I could not have thought that stuff up intentionally if I tried um and so I I think it's an and I actually in my live streams I'll often tell people like okay we're gonna do this now I'm just gonna play like 12 bar blues and you guys just throw whatever words you want in the comments and you can try and make them 
you know, work with whatever the other people are saying, or you can make, throw in like a curveball to talk about something entirely unrelated. And I'm just going to sing whatever comes out to that, you know, and, and it's super fun. It's so nice to just let go of the idea of, of how it's meant to be and let it just exist as whatever it wants to be. Um, so yeah, to, to, in short, I love improvisation. I feel like the more I get out of the way and write in so-called writing a song, as you say, like the more there's a chance for something really weird and beautiful to happen. Yeah, I can empathize with that. Um, getting out of the way there. Um, you use several phrases there, like the song arrived and then poured out and these kind of metaphors of journeying and water are often used with, with song and mm. songwriting as well. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about shamanistic energy. You talk a little bit about this. Could could you expand on that for us? Hmm. I, uh, you know, it's funny. I've I've worked quite extensively with, at this point with plant medicine. It's been a, a massive part of my healing. Is this it's, like, it's taken me a long time. Pardon? Is this a link to the, the idea of folk music medicine? That's ex exactly. So, so basically for me, when I'm talking about plant medicine, I'm talking about psilocybin or ayahuasca, mm -hmm. one of these psychedelic medicines, which are now being touted as like some of the most impactful uh, medicines for people who struggle with depression or PTSD or any, uh, many other kinds of issues. And not only that, but there's a whole branch of thinking that is saying that not only could we look at this for unwell people, but for those, how does it affect those who are are so-called well or in a, in a stable state? What can it give to them? And anyway, for me, it has been a profound part of my healing journey. And in one of those journeys, I literally sat up. I remember so clearly I, I was lying down having this intense psychedelic unraveling occur as, as I was shown all the things I needed to see to be able to heal. And and I sat up at one point and I just shouted out, I am the medicine. And it was like the clearest, most simple thing. And it made 100% sense that I am the medicine. And I'm not saying no one else is the medicine. I'm the only medicine. But in my world, the only way I get to, get to experience this reality is through my perception, the perception of Nathan. And... And so in that moment, it was just the realization that everything I thought I could find somewhere else outside, often in some, you know, a book or in a therapist or in whatever it was, I am the medicine. And so what I was also shown is that that part of the way that I can share the medicine is through the music and through the stories. And that's where folk music medicine kind of was born in, into the conscious. It had already been happening. That's what my music has always been about. I mean, years ago, be long before that experience, there was a psychologist at one of my house concerts and she came up to me afterwards. She said, you know, this, everything you've sung about is everything I work with, with my patients every single day. Like this is my job. And she, and it was amazing. It was an incredible thing to hear. So, so the music medicine has always been there. It's just, I'm only have really begun to know it and acknowledge it uh, consciously in the last sort of couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um. I was thinking a little bit about the blues to go off on a tangent there, but it is related. Um, so the way that the country blues artists um, would kind of find a tune and it was very much about the performance rather than the song being written down. Obviously, a lot of blues players were illiterate. You know, if we're going back looking in um, mm. American blues history and songs songs could sort of you could say that these songs sort of arrive they perform them and then the songs left in a sense um mm. and i think when i think about nomadic songwriting practices i'm thinking about what that what that could be other than the sort of general sort of meaning of what it might mean um so as i see it like the limit case of a nomadic songwriting practice might be the one that's not written down Mm. so for most of my songs they're not written down um i could write them down but mm. they, they happen you know they 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 come about um and then i perform them and record them this is usually as well as single takes in the moment of production and 
then you kind of step away from it and look at what you've got yeah and you listen back mm. but you know that experience um which can be quite intimate as well mm. as if something's just happened and mm. um so i guess that goes back to what you were saying about getting out of the way in that process um i can relate to that what do you think about this this idea of um a song not being written down you know that this could be in the sense that the song is nomadic that it it, it doesn't want to be contained on paper that it exists in time and no other place does a song need to be written down does it need to be re-performed hmm. i think those are such great questions i absolutely love what that kind of does to my brain <laughs> um i i you know generally <laughs> No, I just love that. That's fantastic. I, you know, it's so interesting because earlier you were saying there was something you said I can't remember what, but it it get, brought me the thought that how music is this art form that only exists when it's happening. That this you can't. It happens and then it's not. It's like it's the perfect representation of the present moment in a way. Like there's no way to sit and stare at a song. Uh, like with a painting. I mean, and, and and everything actually is like that, just at different frame rates of existence. So like a painting, give it, you know, give it a thousand years, that thing will be gone. <laughs> uh, and and I think one of the one of the things I don't like about the modern world is that we can record songs because, I mean, and, and I love that obviously, but but I don't love it because there, a song is never the same song twice if it's played by people. It, it just can't be. And so we've got this a false idea that if I record a song and then put it out there, that like that's the that's the version of the song everyone thinks is the version of the song. But a song is is a is it like a tree? It's always growing and changing. And mm-hmm. sometimes the melody wants to be this way, sometimes it wants to be that way. Sometimes a word needs to change because my perception of the world has changed. And uh, and I I think you know. As someone who has absolutely loved reading for my entire life and lyrics, like really just so into books and lyrics, I I think it's really sad sometimes that we created writing. I, I just think that there was a there's a quote from someone, and I think it's kind of hilarious that the quote only exists because someone must have written it down. But it was <laughs> at the time when writing was become becoming popularized, and it was a long time ago. I, I don't want to say exactly because I don't know the amounts, but it was at a time when for the first time ever, it was becoming more available, written, the written word. And some kind of philosopher said, we have no idea of the magnitude of what we are losing by by taking on this technology. And and when I first read it, I was like, what the hell is he talking about? That's insane. But I, And then I connected it with another piece from Elder Maledoma. Uh, I think that's his name. He's from Kenya, I believe. And he was trained both in a lineage of shamans, like 16th generation shaman, and then was sent to America He's still alive today, but he was sent to America to to kind of be a bridge between the worlds. And he, you know, he got several degrees, at least two. And so he really understands both the worlds. And when he went back to his elders after he had studied in the States, they said, now you have a disease that you can never recover from. There is no cure for this for this illness that you now have. And he was like, what, is, what do you mean? And they said, well, because when you learn to read and write you close doors that can never be opened again. And uh, and so, and that connected me with this, what the other person had said. And I really, I'm coming to realize that every new so-called technology or new invention that, that society has taken on with enthusiasm, thinking this is going to make everything better, has come at the cost of something else. And, and I don't know that we'll ever be able to know exactly what it's come at the cost of. But, but as Rene Marie Rilke says that um, we must main, remain open to the, to the, to the wildest of things, even the most mysterious of things. And the fact that we've been kind of lax in that is one of the, the greatest sort of crimes that we've done on ourselves is to, is to sort of, um, what's the word, to put to sleep, there's a better word than that, but to atrophy the senses that could have had those experiences. Uh, and we've done that. And I, and I believe, so anyway, and as, again, I, I struggle to answer questions quickly because there's always so much in it. But around, I, I believe that it's an incredible opportunity and it makes me sad. It's both beautiful and sad to put a song, to let it flow out and then let it completely go. I think that is like one of the most magical, mysterious things that someone can do. And, uh, and I think we used to have a lot more experiences like that before we created all these things that are meant to like capture time. Uh, and they do so quite ineffectually, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, and songwriting, um, 
Gillian Walsh, the the uh, American mm. singer, um, was talking about songwriting's relationship to time, you know, and obviously many other people have spoken about it because song is temporal. But this idea that songs um, step outside of time, they reshape time, they retrace it, they predict it. Um, in my own songwriting, I think, you know, sometimes I think, and Nick Cave talks about this as well, this idea that songs know more than we do, that they mm-hmm. can predict things. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. Yeah, um, it's in his um, Vienna um, lectures, two lectures on the love song um, that he um, recorded and um, at the Vienna Poetry Festival in 2000, I think. And he, t- he talks about the idea of, of songs kind of having agency and sort of knowing more. I think sometimes that we do well we to, to listen to songs mm. I've often felt that with my own songwriting that that songs have kind of predicated things or yeah I'm not sure how that works um improvisation is is sort of thinking forward isn't it at the moment something's coming through you you, Mm -hmm. you're also thinking forward so temporally it's a really um strange place to be in um when (laughs) when these songs are coming but do you think do you think songs can predict things do they know things Ah, oh, you know, I'm actually about to teach a a little a workshop called How to Own Your Reality. And it's it's kind of an experiment because part of the invitation I've been receiving is that I have gathered enough knowledge and information that it's important that I share it, that it that is part of the medicine is to share. And so I'm doing this experiment. And so I've been looking for some quotes and things that kind of connect with what it is I want people to understand. <laughs> the first quote I'm sharing before we've got into anything is by R. R. Buckminster Fuller. And he says, since the initial publication of the chart of the electromagnetic spectrum, humans have learned that what they can touch, smell, see, and hear is less than one millionth of reality. And and so, because I basically want to let people know, like, listen, let's just acknowledge, first of all, that everyone knows almost nothing. <laughs> And so the the idea that a song could predict things that are unfolding, absolutely, absolutely why not? I, I, I feel like it's, again, what um, what Rene Marie Relko was saying, the fact that we've atrophied these senses that would have given us access to those kind of worlds more consistently, it's it's terrible. It's ter- It's so sad. And I, I, I believe that our sen- my senses, I know, like, I think that same place where the songs come from that we've been talking about, you know, that subconscious where I'll sit down and suddenly an entire message will will pour forth uh that is an indication that it's some way some part of me is aware of of so much more than my conscious part is that it's like this massive i love how um elizabeth gilbert of eat pray love talks about it as as an idea as like a spirit like a little actual conscious entity that's floating around and it's trying to find someone to manifest it and and it'll come. And she she talks about how she had an experience. And the reason she she's like, I really believe this. This isn't just metaphor. Like I actually believe this. And she said, where an idea came to her for a story, and in the moment she was like, listen, I, I just don't have time for this. Like I can't. And and two weeks later or something like that, like a short time later, a friend of hers who lived distant from her wrote the exact story. She said it was so so identical that there's no way that it could have come that it could be some accidental thing that that idea had actually floated off and found a receptive mind and planted itself and flourished there and um and i just think that that's that's profound like that's actual magic um and so who knows what our songs could bring to us if only we could stay open enough to to really let them move through <laughs> It's reminding me of um, a quote, I think it was D.H. Lawrence, that said, God is always looking for a body. Oh, my gosh. So, I, I don't know. There's another thing that that, that is exactly on that um, front where there is a, a community in Scotland called Findhorn, which uh, is incredible. I, I read their story, and, and it's so far out there, <laughs> and yet it has very tangible results. And so, basically... They, there was a woman who was hearing the voice of what they call Davic spirits, which other people might call fairies, and and they followed her instructions and they set up this, they moved into a campsite that was on a beach and they started growing food, but it was in sand. It was in sand that should never have been able to maintain 
food, let alone the kind of food they started growing that was just flourishing, these massive vegetables, like they're just out of control. Couldn't believe like soil experts were coming and measuring the soil and being like, this shouldn't be possible. And what they said is that these spirit realms, these Davic realms are, are very good at generating energy, at generating, um, yeah, like not electrical energy, but energy, just energy. Uh, and what they aren't good at which humans are incredibly good at, is manifesting physical action. They can't take physical action, but they can give energy to physical action. And so what they were saying is, if you work with us, if we collaborate and work together, we can create stuff that neither of us could do by ourselves. And whether one wants to believe that story or not, the results are there. They've, they've done it based on that whole belief system and that whole understanding of reality, is that there are beings beyond the physical there are energies and consciousnesses beyond the physical who that want to manifest and want to support manifestation in the physical and humans are the ones who have this incredible capacity to take action and move physical matter around so mm. i don't know who knows <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Fintorn um, community. So it's an interesting place. It's an eco village as well, isn't it? Um, and mm. it, I'd like to visit just to sort of uh, have uh, get a feel for the place. Yeah. Uh, I know that Mike Scott of the Water Boys did some um, did some work. I'm not sure if he recorded an album there, but he certainly went up and worked with the community and produced some music. Um, I think he's a oh, wow. Yeah, Mike Scott um, is someone that I think kind of resonates with what, what we're talking about here a bit as well. Um, Amazing. Coming back to the to the Rilke quote, we must remain open to the wildest of things. Do you think that there is any wild left? <laughs> Well, I'm paraphrasing, I have to acknowledge. I don't think he said the word wild. I just love that <laughs> wild, um, wait, or that word at least. Yeah. You know what? I could find you the quote in an, in an instant if you like. Yeah, but, okay. but in terms of your question, um, I... I believe the wildness is always there. We, we've, <laughs> we've spent... There's a line in, in that song again that I mentioned earlier, Every Leaf, which is one of those songs that really flowed through and it was an answer to kind of prayers that I was having at the time in terms of like, <laughs> how am I going to do this whole life thing? And, and one of the lines, one of the lines in it, it the, the second verse talks about um, reading futures in their veins, talking about the, the leaves that I'm looking at. I read futures in their veins, simply telling me that life always finds a way. And for me, often when I sing that particular line, I become emotional, I tear up. There's something in that that reminds me that <laughs> we can we can spend however long we like pretending that we are not God, that we are not wild, that we are not integrated in, intrinsically into nature, that there is no extracting ourselves from it. All we've been doing for the last several thousand years, or how many, 15, 10 to 15,000 years, since we started the whole civilization experiment, all we've been doing is kind of like shopping on credit in a way. We've been like pretending distancing ourselves making the other nature humans and then everything else but it's not a it's a it's a it's a an illusion because now we are seeing that it is the, the balance is so far off and it will right, right itself and it might mean the extinction of what we currently call life on earth but that's no when held up against the tapestry that is infinity, it's fine. It's just one of the ways that life wants to experience itself. Just go, what does it feel like to pretend that I'm separate from everything? Let's try that for a while. And uh, and it's and I mean I'm saying that and I'm I can it sounds light. It's also terribly sad. I I feel so sad that humans have had this massive arrogance that we've thought that we could dominate nature, uh, which is as far as I'm concerned, God. And and we are going. We are paying the price. There is no way that we have, and we've been paying it for a long time. If I look at how much generational trauma there is in the world, that's a direct result of us pretending that we know better than. And uh, and so yes, the wildness is here always. And, and and there's no. It's just if we choose to open our eyes. And and I also believe that you know. We're currently in at one end of the pendulum, and it's the most uncomfortable end where we have really worked so hard at separating and being like, we can survive outside of nature. And, uh, and it's a very uncomfortable place to be in. So right now, from a, from a three-dimensional time, linear time perspective, I don't see much wildness. Um, but I do see it in, I still see it in nature. I still see it in the way nature operates and in the 
and sort of the eyes of, of those who are, are doing the work and who are waking up and are awoken. So it's, mm. it's here. It's just, uh, it's just been pushed aside for a while. Yeah, there are all these kind of um, almost like well contemporary terms like rewilding and feral and and the rewilding yeah. movement as if um, some people are in opposition to this, aren't they? This idea that that land um, can be rewilded, that that um, that there is such a thing as the wild. Yeah, I I find it interesting because I actually love the term rewilding, and I only found out recently that it's it relates to a specific kind of conservation, and and so what it does is it takes an area and it and as they they rewild it, but what that means is to remove all signs of human interaction, and they just bring all the animals, you know, put all the animals, the the apex predators, get everything kind of operating in an ecosystem again, and what it what it doesn't acknowledge is that humans are nature. We have always been fully integrated for hundreds of thousands of years. We we were as much a part of the ecosystem as any other creature. It's only since we, as I said, this whole civilizational experiment, um, that things have gone way off. And so w- th- what many people are now u- using the term rewilding for is to rewild us because nature is still wild. Mm-hmm. Um, we're the ones who've lost it. And and I actually, I use the term myself more and more, and, and I'm even uh, thinking about starting with my beloved, starting kind of a business that that's more sp- literally about rewilding love, like we were thinking of calling it rewild love, <laughs> um, for the reason that, that love is kind of at the base of everything. I think people say that God is the biggest word we have to describe like the the great mystery, and I would say love is at least a very close second. I can't, if not equal to, um, because love is just such a, an incredible sensation to explore. In I mean, as far as I can see, it's infinite, uh, and and I do believe that at the base of everything, beyond all the stories and the ideas and the identities that we've built up uh, on top of it, uh, love is the foundational uh, experience of the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you. The I made a video in in the landscape. I do the, these improvised kind of um, compositions and video pieces, performance pieces. And after I performed it and played it back, looked at it, I, I called it rewilding. And this word mm. is it's again resonating with me. What we're talking about. Um, it just feels the right word for a, a series of things that I'm doing at the moment. So. Yeah. Um, what you say about removing all signs of human interaction, that's that's really interesting to think about there. Mm. Well, it's just a continuation of the same consciousness that got us into the problem that we're in already. It's it's the idea that if we come over here and have our little human lives and nature's over there, and then, and then we can all just have this clean, surgical kind of technological life over here in our in our tall concrete buildings it's just such a such a weird i mean wendell berry says that i think one of the most beautiful things i've read recently was just we are all farmers by proxy as simple as that this idea that people have that oh i can go live in the city and then i'll just you know not realizing that and i only i didn't realize it until quite recently but that every choice i make around what i buy what I support, what I don't support, how what you know, how I live my life, it ripples out into everything else. By the same token, if someone's, you know, I, there's a, an interesting one, and this might be quite sort of, uh, what's the word, sort of politically charged for some people, but the idea of veganism as a as a sort of uh, a way to fix the world. Uh, and I and I was I mean I worked at a raw vegan cafe in London. I was I, I thought that was like the vibe. I was like, this is what it makes so much sense. We just don't have to kill any animals. It's totally sensible. Um, but from nature's perspective, it doesn't work like that because to, to produce the amount of food that we'd need, what we're talking about is monocropping. And so with a monocrop, in the same way that an industrial farming of of say a cow is the most horrific process. It's just so so bad from start to finish. In the same way, a field of, say, soy, for those who love their soy milk, a field of soy, everything, every single little animal or microbe that was on that soil other than the soy is gone, is 
dead. It is the only way to to produce the kind of masses. So if anyone is just buying their soy milk thinking, oh, well, I'm helping the planet. It's this, It's this. again, it's this idea of humans separate from nature. We can just do it nice and cleanly. There's no blood. Everything's nice. Nature doesn't work like that. Nature is bloody and intense. Mm-hmm. Like nature has everything in nature. Life eats life. There's no other way that it happens. Um, and so, anyway, so this idea of rewilding, I think, is it's it's actually reclaiming something that is really very, uh, very raw, very like intense and um, gut oriented. Like it's it's bloody and it's full on and it's rainbows and majesty and darkness and intensity. Uh, and and I think that our culture, because it's a culture that fears death, like deeply intrinsically, it's part of our society. Is that death is to be avoided at all costs. It's very hard for us as a society to acknowledge we are all going to die. Everything does. And we can just choose the journey in the most sort of elegant way possible. And that's kind of the only choice we might have. (laughs) Nate, I um, thank you for that. I'd love it if you'd play us out with a little tune. Oh, with pleasure. Thank you so much. I feel like I should play every leaf singers. I've talked about it so much, Please. but I will just have to take about 30 seconds to run downstairs, grab my guitar and run back. Yeah, that's fine. We can I'll, I'll be back in a moment. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so every leaf. I'm just going to make sure my little guitar is in tune. And yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It's been really enjoyable, and I hope that your your listeners find whatever it is that oh, they need in this moment. You. It's been a complete pleasure, and um, there's something very, very um, bright about you. And what you're doing thank you very much probably all the darkness i've explored <laughs> <laughs> oh you. man that is that is funny all right let me see what's going on here we'll turn that. Um, mm, just need to find i seem to have misplaced my actual tuner anyway i'll tell you a bit of the story while i'm uh, yeah, working okay. myself out here but but basically as i mentioned earlier i've plant medicine has been so like at one point i was it was like it's either antidepressants or or death like i was just so at the end of what i felt like i could handle with reality and the world and everything and and in fact a lot of people were recommending were saying you know you should probably go on antidepressants but the more i looked at antidepressants the more i was like that seems like a terrible idea um based on i, I read an incredible book called Lost Connections uh, by Johan Hari and and based on his research just kind of it really I don't know it just didn't seem like a good idea and at the same time the research that I was reading kept coming back that plant medicine has this huge potential for helping people and so I was like all right well if I can find someone who can help me let's who can help me to, to explore these medicines let's give it a go and so I had this this first really big, what they call a heroic dose <laughs> of uh, of psilocybin under under you know absolute supervision. I would definitely wouldn't recommend anyone tries this at home or or pretty much yeah make sure you know what you're up to. It's not not for playing with. Uh, and and I had this profound experience where I basically had full what they call ego death, so the death of the identity of Nathan, which was. Uh, maybe as te- more terrifying than it sounds, perhaps. <laughs> and uh, I, but beyond that, what I experienced was something infinite and and actually just so beautiful and all love and really, really kind of true. And in a way that, as they say, with a mystical experience, it it seems utterly true to the person who's had it. Uh, and that's how it felt to me. And and so then it was beautiful and it was such a relief. And I went home, and the next day I woke up, and I still felt depressed. I still didn't know what I was doing with myself. Still had chronic pain, and it was, and and that was really hard. I was like, what now after all this? And and so I I went and I sat outside. I picked up my guitar for the first time in months, and I sat outside under a tree, and uh, and started just kind of playing, 
and then I saw a leaf on the ground and I picked up the leaf and I looked at it really closely and I just kept looking at it. And I had this just moment of like, whoa, I could magnify this leaf pretty much, I mean, as close to infinity as makes no difference to me. And and I could do the same. I could then go out into the stars and the galaxies and just beyond the beyond the beyond. And yet here I am within it. And and it is within me as well. And and then the song kind of just arrived. In every leaf a universe, in every verse A unity of leaves and trees and mysteries Oh, who knows what it means In every leaf a universe, in every verse A unity of leaves and trees and mysteries Oh, who knows what it means sitting in your shade mm, filled with gratitude for every leaf you've made the sun is shining bright today mm, so I'll rest a while and soon I'll be on my way in every leaf a universe in every verse a unity of leaves and trees and mysteries oh who knows what it means i read futures in their veins mm, simply telling me that life always finds a way until i am back home again sit here in wonder learning how to pray in every leaf a universe in every verse a unity of leaves and trees and mysteries oh who knows what it means A unity of leaves and trees and mysteries Oh, who knows what it means In every leaf a universe In every verse A unity of leaves and trees and mysteries Oh, who knows what it means Who knows what it means Who knows what it means Oh, who knows what it means now look at all these scenes.